Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for swimming here. Uh, <laughs> you know this is a hearty group uh, to come out in the rain. My name is Heather Conley. I am Senior Fellow and Director of the Europe Program here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And we have a fantastic uh, discussion planned for you this morning. So by coming through the rain, we are going to give you a treat as you drip dry. Um, uh, we uh, are, CSIS is a fantastic partnership uh, with the East Magazine, and I'm going to ask uh, my colleague Giuseppe to tell you a little bit about the magazine. But uh, amidst all the complexity and the events uh, that are going on globally, we wanted to shine a spotlight on some pretty f uh, fundamental uh, transformations going on in Southeast Europe, particularly in Turkey uh, and in Italy. And that was before the crisis in Ukraine. So now we see, as we said in the title, the the global shock waves, if you will, from that crisis and what their impact will be on Southeast Europe in addition to the, the dynamics within the region. And evidently, the Wall Street Journal must have had the foresight and knowing our discussion this morning because there's a very provocative article entitled, Can Italy Find the Way Back? So again, I think we are so topical uh, and so timely today. Let me briefly introduce our three panelists and then I will get out of the way and let them share uh, their insights with you. And again, first, we are so delighted to welcome Giuseppe Scognamilio. How did I do? Oh, oh God bless. God bless. <laughs> I told him that if there was one thing I was stressed about, it was pronouncing his last name. Uh, Gios and then he gave me my pr permission to call him Giuseppe for the rest of the morning. Uh, Giuseppe, thank you for being with us. You are president of a publishing house called Europe Eye and editor of the Geopolitical and International Economic Magazine. East European Crossroads, but he is a career diplomat and has served with distinction at the United Nations uh, in Turkey and Argentina. He has also served as diplomatic counselor for international relations for two ministers of industry and trade. One of those ministers was Enrico Letta, so uh, we certainly know that Giuseppe is well-placed to tell us uh, dynamics within Italy, but also Turkey and, uh, and in the region. And then we are delighted to turn to my friend Tim Adams, who is president and CEO of the Inter, uh, International, uh, the Institute of International Finance, IIF. Uh, my favorite title for Tim, though, is CSIS Senior Advisor. Uh, we rely on Tim so completely for his insights on the international economic situation. Uh, Tim has also has previously served as Under Secretary of Treasury for International Affairs. He has also served as a Chief of Staff to two uh, Treasury Secretaries. So extremely well placed to tell us what are the dynamics, uh, the international eco economic dynamics, and hopefully he'll help us stare into a crystal ball and tell us what all of this means. Some very gloomy economic data coming out this morning about the U.S. Uh, so I hope you help us understand uh, those dynamics. And last but not least, CSIS is delighted to welcome Anne Marie Slaughter, the president and CEO of New America, and I'll let her explain a little bit of that. Um, Anne Marie. Uh, is currently a Professor Emerita of Politics and International Affairs at Princeton University, and we know her so well for serving as the first female Director of Policy Planning at the State Department from 2009 to 2011. Uh, prior to that, she was the Dean of Princeton's uh, Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. So I told you, this is a lineup. We are going to learn a lot today uh, about this important part of the world and I'm sure help put some very, uh, very transformative events in some perspectives. So with that, welcome. Thank you all for being with us and I will turn the floor to Giuseppe. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, I'll try to go through uh, the 10, 12 questions that you uh, put on the table. Um, uh, being brief at the same time. Um, you, you asked first uh, uh, to say a few words about the magazine. Uh, I start from there since we are uh, starting, we started uh, only a few months ago to distribute the magazine also in the United States. Uh, and this is, uh, has been uh, uh, for us uh, uh, a meaningful uh, initiative uh, because we think that uh, uh, 
modestly that the only uh, competitor that we have uh, at the time on, on the market is foreign policy. That, uh, that is American uh, um, made, uh, and so we, we want to be the European alternative to, to foreign policy. Uh, hopefully we can do with your help. Uh, if you buy our magazine, uh, you can... You can uh, <laughs> Uh, for, for the time being, we are in, uh, in 21 countries distributing uh, the magazine, uh, so from the from United States uh, to Brazil, uh, in the Americas, and, uh, and to Japan, uh, in Asia, and main European countries. So uh, this is on the retail market, uh, it is quite a big effort. Um, and um, in, in, for the time being, we are only in uh, some independent uh, um, bookstores here in, in the States, but I think very soon we want to uh, make a big investment and, uh, and go through uh, big chain, chains like uh, Barnes and Nobles, we'll see. Um, uh, so um, more and more important the American market as far as um, our magazine is concerned. Uh, the focus of our... Uh, initiative in the magazine is uh, uh, the European integration. We want uh, a Europe a protagonist of the future scenarios. Uh, and of course, uh, looking at, at the emerging markets means above all East, but uh, um, we uh, want to stimulate uh, the international debate, uh, focusing on Europe in a period of time in which uh, when you uh, speak about Europe, you associate always the word crisis with Europe. Uh, but we try also to see uh, what we can um, positively have from uh, this process that is not, uh, that, is, that, 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 that I think is, is developing and, and we will see also through um, the single issues that we have on the table. Why? Uh, well, uh, having said that, uh, as an introduction, maybe I, I let me say just a few words uh, uh, on the on the on the single issues, um, starting from Turkey. Maybe uh, we have. Uh, um, I mean, I, I feel entitled to say uh, uh, something about Turkey, not only because I know it uh, since a long time, having having lived there at the beginning of my diplomatic career, but then I have never left uh, uh, aside this country from my life. Uh, now Unicredit uh, as a, an important bank uh, in Turkey, it's uh, the third bank of the country uh, with uh, almost 2,000 branches around and uh, uh, 18,000 people uh, in the working employees, so we have uh, quite a, a peculiar and important um, observation, point of observation in the country. I think that uh, uh, many uh, opinionists have been uh, surprised by the recent elections, uh, uh, local elections in Turkey, because of this outstanding vic victory uh, of uh, Erdogan. Uh, I must say, not so much we were, uh, because uh, f for a couple of good reasons. Uh, first, uh, um, the people uh, are still grateful to Erdogan for what has been, for sure, the, the best 10 years in their recent history. Uh, the success uh, that Erdogan has guaranteed uh, in economic terms, in social growth, and uh, uh, also for the development of the middle class, that uh, this is a very important uh, target that has been achieved, uh, in, uh, and and uh, uh, for the first time uh, in, in, in Turkish history, I think is uh, is um, is one of the main reasons for the vote, and uh, and uh, it's not true uh, like someone has has written that uh, the vote is only the. Uh, the rural vote, uh, because if you see the map of Turkey and you check uh, where uh, the opposition party, the, the Kemalist uh, uh, traditional party, uh, has, has, has gained uh, um, the, the, the cities, this is uh, 
only in uh, uh, Izmir, that is, yes, a progressive area of the country, but then is in Trakia, that is at all uh, progressive. It's, uh, it's on the contrary, the most nationalist uh, uh, regions of the country. So the CHP and this leadership, uh, uh, Kilic Darolu, they express really something old, uh, that is uh, not at all um, uh, able to uh, draw a, a, a future of progress for the country. So there is no alternative. This is another, this is another very important uh, aspect to Erdogan and to AKP. Um, uh, the, the economic successes that are in the figures that everyone knows uh, about Turkey has uh, uh, allowed uh, the development uh, also of a small and medium enterprise uh, in uh, all the Anatolian uh, part uh, uh, of the country that is, uh, that is the biggest part uh, where, where AKP has, uh, has uh, won elections. And this uh, is uh, also a, a very important social effect, not only economic, because the, small, the development of a small enterprise means also distribution of richness. Mm -hmm means a lot of things that not necessarily you can achieve easily with fiscal reform, uh, or, or at least it, it takes you much more time than... So uh, we, we do not have to under-evaluate uh, uh, these, these effects. And, and, you f and if you then look uh, through what is happening in the, in the Turkish society, you realize that there is uh, many uh, witnesses of modernity in, uh, in, uh, in what is happening. So paradoxically and uh, differently from what uh, we Western, in the Western countries we are tended to, to think, uh, the religious party has guaranteed progress in the country, while the Kemalist uh, party represents uh, tradition uh, in these uh, in this latest uh, uh, years. Um, let me just mention a couple of examples, some figures that give you uh, also uh, give substance to what I'm saying. From the experience on the ground, uh, for example, you uh, in, in our group, uh, in the banking group, uh, we used to um, fix uh, um, in a sector, sectors, uh, the, the leadership of uh, specific sectors, where we find uh, that this sector is more innovative and, uh, and developed. Uh, for example, credit card, that is a, a very um, high technology sector. We decided that uh, uh, all over the 17 countries in Europe where we have banks, uh, we decided that Turkey in Istanbul we fix the center of governance of all the credit card sector in the group. Because in Turkey, we found the most innovative uh, uh, capacity. And now a woman, a Turkish woman, is the leader of the whole credit card of our group. Uh, this is a, 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 a good example. Uh, and we have exported in uh, only six months this uh, uh, highly innovative uh, uh, component to all the other countries. For example, this is one of the good reasons for having international groups. Uh, we could export the, credit card system, the Turkish credit card system in countries like Bosnia, Croatia, or Serbia that would have taken uh, two generations for, for having the same um, innovative system. Uh, and. Uh, uh, Having uh, spoken of a woman, not for, for case, uh, uh, another perception, uh, wrong perception about the Turkish society is the role of women. Um, if I compare the bank that we have in Turkey with the bank that uh, we have in Italy, uh, in Turkey, 60% of uh, our employees are women. In Italy, 52%, so less. And when you go to top management, in uh, uh, Turkey, uh, we have 21% that are top managers. In Italy, 9%. So it falls down. In Italy, more than in Turkey, the percentage. That gives, again, another example of how modern and, uh, the, the Turkish society is developing. Uh, let me just give you 
uh, another couple of examples that I think are quite meaningful that I just uh, wrote it down. Um, apart from the attraction that Turkey now has, like in terms of uh, tourism revenues, it is the, the sixth country in the world for attraction of tourists uh, after Italy, uh, that is the fifth. But uh, I think that uh, some numbers may be not so uh, well known are signif significant. Let me mention, for example, this uh, uh, 36 million internet users uh, wow. that makes uh, uh, Turkey uh, among the top 20 countries in the world. And with 46% of uh, uh, penetration, rate of penetration, it ranks it 11th in the world. That may be something not so uh, common, uh, so, so not so well known. Um, and, 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 and it is, by the way, uh, again, a uh, couple of positions more advanced than Italy. Uh, let me just use Italy as an, an example of a Western society that, uh, that we, are cons we, cons we tend to consider more modern than Turkey. Uh, I already mentioned the credit card penetration, and again, uh, also in this case, uh, uh, in, in terms of credit cards, the Turks have 54 million credit cards. Uh, um, that means uh, uh, second uh, uh, highest penetration in Europe. Uh, um, this, these uh, are only cell phones. Also, this seems to me quite significant. Cell phones, 93.7% uh, uh, of penetration rate, around 70 million users. Uh, that makes it uh, the fifth highest rate of growth in the world for use of cell phones. Also, social networking seems to me quite uh, significant. Ranks seventh in the world among Facebook users, 11th with Twitter, 14th with YouTube, and 20th among Pinterest users. So, I mean, this is just some of the examples that I chose to show that uh, uh, the AKP revolution uh, has meant a lot for, for the Turkish society. So it's not, uh, of course, uh, we know uh, and we have seen that uh, in the latest uh, 18 months from Gezi Park uh, to the corruption scandals uh, and to the, also in terms of freedom of press, uh, Erdogan maybe he, he is not uh, lucid like uh, if it, he was uh, like uh, he was before in keeping a good balance uh, uh, between the most traditional and most extremist uh, part of uh, of his supporters. But uh, this, after 12 years of uh, good governance, uh, is something that may happen, and of course is causing uh, some problems also in economic terms, even if not to the structural, I would say, uh, numbers, but. Uh, um, um, that is already recovering, by the way. But, uh, uh, and so the, the, the bet for the future is how much this leadership is able uh, to go on uh, and to overcome uh, what I consider a, a normal, uh, uh, I would say, um, fatigue of being uh, uh, leading the country for so long. Uh, uh, again, uh, what is the alternative? This is uh, important to, to understand. Uh, I don't see any for the time being. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is part of the issue. I would stop here, even if I touch only two of the three or four questions that you put, but I think we will have a possibility to, to say something later on. Well, thank you, Giuseppe. And we definitely want to circle back uh, to you on, on, on Italy. I think, number one, foreign policy. David Rothkopf, look out. East Magazine is coming. Uh, thank you for, for that. Um, and uh, I, those numbers are quite stunning on, on the internet use, the cell phone use. And it does, it's a very, it's an incredible paradox that actually Prime Minister Erdogan has been trying to suppress that very impressive social uh, media network. All right, Mr. Adams, look into our economic crystal ball. How can leaders deliver growth in this very challenging environment? And Italy's been struggling with this for the last decade, and Turkey may be struggling with it as Syrian crisis, Russia, Ukraine issues, actually external factors may really be impacting this growing emerging market. They call it the dismal science for a reason. 
Uh, you know, the way I think about it is, um, you know, Turkey was a high flyer for, for the pre-crisis, for the decade prior to the crisis, uh, averaging 6% growth, really integrating uh, further into Europe. There's a tremendous amount of European FDI into Turkey. Uh, and it rode the wave, as so many emerging markets did. And then the crisis hit, which began to buffet uh, the Turkish economy, although they have benefited in the post-crisis uh, period because of the ocean of cheap and abundant capital. As investors were searching for yield, and Turkey was still riding on its, uh, its laurels from the previous decade. And then, of course, we had the European crisis, which, uh, which not only hit Italy, but also hit Turkey. And then we have uh, the political crisis, the internal political crisis uh, of the past uh, year. Uh, as as uh, Ben Bernanke a year ago started talking about tapering, and we had a very tough and uh, tumultuous time in the emerging markets last May and June, then again this January. Uh, and then just as you think things may have stabilized a bit, just uh, you know a 45-minute flight to the north, you have problems in Crimea and Ukraine. And, and it, obviously Russia as well. We could talk a lot about that. There's a lot of Turkish exposure, construction companies and others, uh, Turkish exposure to Russia. So it's, a, it's an economy that uh, performed extraordinarily well for many, many years, but is, uh, is struggling. Uh, and will, I think, continue to face challenges just because of political uncertainty. We got through the municipal elections uh, late last month, but we have the presidential elections coming up in August, and then the parliamentary elections uh, mid-2015. And it, it will continue to hang over an economy which is incredibly dependent on imported capital, right? And I like to say capital is a coward. It goes where it's treated well and it flees where it's treated badly. And Turkey's got a roll about $160 billion worth of uh, short-term debt this year. So they're very vulnerable to shocks in the system, whether it comes from the Federal Reserve or whether it comes uh, from domestic conditions. Uh, the central bank hiked rates uh, in response to the crisis in January, uh, su substantially hiked rates, which is having a deleterious effect on growth. We do see a contraction in, in, uh, in credit. Uh, banks are hunkering down. Many of the top uh, banks uh, in Turkey are members of the IIF uh, and certainly become much more cautious about domestic conditions as well as their exposure to Europe and exposure regionally. And it's not just the region to the north. The region to the south is a pretty tough neighborhood as well. Uh, and inflation is a problem, although uh, I think most analysts believe that inflation breaks mid-year and, and tends to fall off the end of the year. Maybe the central bank can begin to ease monetary conditions a bit. But it is an economy that will remain dependent and therefore vulnerable to uh, external shocks as well as internal shocks. Uh, and, uh, and we just have to get through these milestones of dealing with some of the, the political uncertainty. Uh, they also have invested in a way which reminds me of Spain and, and the periphery and including the U.S. Uh, in the 1990s in that it's mostly about construction. Some of that is infrastructure, but if you tour around Istanbul, there's a lot of buildings being built there or, or there now that weren't there 10 years ago. Again, part of this extraordinary growth story where per capita income has exploded in the past decade, but it's, it's investment in the non-tradable sector. Uh, which doesn't help them with respect to a very large current account deficit. They're heavily dependent on imported energy, so it's another source of vulnerability. But it's an economy that continues to focus and spend time and attention and resources on the non-tradable sector, and I suspect we could see even more of that if the government feels that it's, uh, the, the economy is weaker than they'd like and they'll start spending a little bit with, uh, with respect to some fiscal stimulus. So uh, that's a problem because it's tough to deal with external imbalances if you're not investing in the export capacity of your economy. Uh, and as we learned in the U.S., with a massive amount of investment in housing or in Spain, uh, eventually you have to find ways to earn income to pay off your, your external debts. But with respect to uh, Italy, it's a different story. It's been you know, a, a long-term and long-time discussion that you and I and my dear friend Arrigo Sedun and others have been uh, have been discussing the challenges facing the Italian economy uh, existed prior to the crisis and as it exists now. We have very low productivity. We have a labor force that needs to be updated. We have high unemployment. Uh, deflationary pressures, the, the European-wide inflation numbers are out this morning, a little bit weaker, depending on which, which statistic you use, but a little bit weaker than expected, certainly on the radar screen of the ECB as, uh, as uh, Mario Draghi continues to threaten to do and undertake extraordinary policies. Which, which will benefit Italy and Europe uh, writ large. 
but Italy's problems are really about, uh, about competitiveness and productivity. Now I've got a whole host of statistics about where Italy ranks on the World Bank doing business report. And it really is about uh, creating a much more productive and competitive environment, changing the industrial structure of Italy, which is really quite fascinating to look at. In fact, uh, Mario Draghi, uh, during one of his stints in the official sector, looked at the structural rigidities in uh, the Italian economy. It was alluded to in this excellent Wall Street Journal piece today, in which you have a, a whole host of very small firms that operate under just certain thresholds uh, where regulators or the tax man shows up and begins to pay attention to you. So you have uh, this proliferation of very small family-owned enterprises. Some of them are world-class. They're the best uh, around in the, what they do. But you cannot get the kind of uh, volume or the, the efficiencies of, of size. And they're also starved of capital. My colleague Jeff Anderson has just written a seminal piece on SME funding in the peripheral countries. And each of the peripheral countries suffer from its own unique maladies. But Italy is, uh, is also suffering. And it, those firms, those small, medium-sized enterprises that can get access to capital are paying uh, significant amounts of money for it. The, the, the cost of capital is very, very high. It's simply not sustainable. So it really is about uh, a new government. We have a new prime minister, very young, very charismatic, uh, a, a generational change in Italian politics. Uh, who is uh, very ambitious and, and has certainly started on the supply side of the economy, which I think is right, but there are enormous vested interests, which, which you know well, the labor unions and, and others that are going to make this uh, a trench warfare for him. So I hope, I wish him all the best. I hope that he can continue to show success. Uh, the, this, there is a cyclical recovery in Europe. There's a cyclical recovery here, although it looks a little weak this morning, but uh, it really is about creating a more competitive uh, economy, uh, larger scale, and dealing with all the sclerosis, all the regulatory burdens, the tax burdens that exist that really keep that economy from growing at a half a percentage point to three percentage points, or, or you know, who knows, maybe higher. I'll stop there. Great. Tim, thank you so much. Um, Henry, help us put this in a larger framework, a larger perspective, looking at the geopolitical situation and and where this very important part of the world fits into that. Great. Thank you. Uh, so two, two preliminary remarks. Uh, one, just when I listened uh, to oh, Giuseppe. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, when I was listening to Giuseppe, I was remembering uh, when I was in the State Department uh, on my first trip to Turkey. And I met uh, with the two business uh, associations. One is Tusiad, the traditional secular, you would say, allied with the Kamalist parties, big business, uh, and not particularly happy with uh, uh, the AK party. And then I met with Musiad, which is exactly the small and medium enterprises. And I wrote back to the State Department that this was just like meeting with Republican small and medium enterprise in the Midwest, faith, family, and flag, right? They were, they were religious. They were committed to kind of traditional values uh, in terms of, of family. I mean, it wasn't, it, it felt very familiar to me, that regardless of whether it was Islamic or Christian, the point was kind of good, good traditional values, uh, and then and nationalists, uh, but in, in a kind of proud way. And so just to, to underline your, your point, uh, it, was, it was very far from the picture of, uh, you know, an Islamist party that had taken over, it felt more like red state Turks, uh, if I, <laughs> in, in, in the way. Um, and j just a, a quick comment, uh, Tim, on your point as I'm listening to you as to how Italy will uh, rescue its economy. We are building a small house in Umbria, which we've, we've been there for 20 straight years. We finally decided, okay, we're going to build. And my husband keeps reading the paper going, any day now, it's going to be taxes on foreign-owned property. <laughs> so let's hope that's not the, let's hope it remains uh, the fifth most visited tourist destination and doesn't alienate its, uh, those, those of us who love it. So I'm going to give you uh, three points, really, as uh, Heather, as you said, um, looking at the diplomatic context and trying to take the economics into account, uh, but also looking uh, at energy um, specifically at the end. Uh, and the first thing I want to say in terms of the fallout from Ukraine 
is to borrow from uh, my former boss, Secretary Clinton's, uh, one of her favorite frames is that we shouldn't be looking at either or, we should be looking at both and. And I'm gonna use that to talk about Italy and Turkey uh, in particular, but actually all the parts of uh, NATO or of Europe who have close relations with Russia. Because we are looking at this as either you side with the United States and Poland and the Baltic states and Romania and you support really strong sanctions on Russia, or you uh, follow your commercial interest, particularly your energy interest, and you try to block those sanctions uh, and you make nice uh, with, with Moscow. I, I think that's the wrong way to look at it. I really do think it has to be both and. If Russia succeeds in destabilizing, much less annexing, uh, south, so, southeastern Ukraine. We are going to see a period of instability in former Eastern Europe that is going to be very bad for everybody. It's really, it's going to be bad for Russia, it's going to be bad for Europe, it's going to be bad for the global economy. So everybody has a stake in basically saying stop. Uh, and frankly, creating a combination of real pressure and a face-saving diplomatic settlement that allows Putin to climb down. Because it, one of the dangers of sanctions is if we push too hard, he will have paid the cost and then he might as well get the benefit, right? Because the benefit nationally to him in terms of staying in power in Russia is to go ahead and bring in as mu many former, uh, many territories with Russian speakers, let me put it that way, uh, as possible. So you wanna, you, you wanna make clear, look, you're going to pay an enormous cost if you keep going uh, and, and particularly you know, he can keep people on the border, he can keep separatists there. The, the, to me, the red line is crossing to some, the, uh, some kind of an, another referendum annexation, however he does it, because that, at that point, you are dismembering a country, and you cannot do that. We can't recognize what he already did in Crimea, we, but above all, that's been done. You cannot recognize it. You can fight it over the long term. You must stop him where he is. So it seems to me everybody, Turkey and Italy, absolutely combined, particularly given their economic situation, have a stake in joining a set of sanctions that are very carefully calibrated, as I said, to say, stop now, or you are going to feel much, much more pain. But if, if you note what we did on Monday, we didn't go too far, because you, you really, it's got to be enough to deter, not so much as to say, fine, okay, I'm gonna pay this price now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna reap the benefits. So that's on the side of joining the sanctions. But the flip side is, all of us, the US, Western Europe, we all have, we should have a relationship with Russia that is both adversarial in some areas, but it's also cooperative in others. I mean, right now we need, we need Russia to get a deal with Iran. We need Russia ultimately to do whatever, if we're ever gonna get anything in Syria, we can't get it without Russia. On a host of other issues, raising, raising, ranging from trade to climate change uh, to uh, international criminal activity to terrorism, we have to still be able to deal with Russia. So the way I look at it is Turkey and Italy are remarkably well placed to be the both and. They are the countries that, they are countries that have very strong relations with Russia, as does Germany. We need those countries, we need those ties at the same time that they need to be sending a tough message. This can be done. I mean, Secretary Clinton used to say, you know, you can walk and chew gum at the same time. We are tough on, with China on a bunch of things, but we also co cooperate with China on a bunch of things. And the two are not, this sort of immediate line up on one side or the other, I think misunderstands the complexity of the relationship and misunderstands where we need to go. So that's the, the first point uh, I would, would make in terms of individual uh, countries. The second, you know, going from individual countries to blocks of countries is, you know, I was in Brussels at the Brussels Forum, uh, the German Marshall Fund Brussels Forum, uh, right after the annexation of Crimea, and I wrote about this in the Washington Post. There was a kind of 
um, gee, we're back in business, right? We're in NATO, we're in Brussels, we're the head of NATO, we're talking to former NATO secretaries general. You know, the U.S. has been going over and beating up on the Europeans every year, twice a year. Your, your defense spending is way below the 2%, you know? And this was kind of okay. You know, we, we now are back on familiar turf where NATO has a reason to exist. Russia has, has shown its colors once again. I'm all for a tighter transatlantic relationship. I always am. I'm half Belgian, so you know it's kind of I come by it naturally. But and I and I do think this is going to push NATO closer together. It has to. But we go too far. We are going to push Russia and China together. And we've been we've seen that movie before too. Right? And nobody. Well, a few of you in this room. Many of you are way too young to remember uh, the Sino-Soviet alliance, much less the Sino-Soviet split. But the point being, if you really push too hard on block politics here, then you're not leaving Russia anywhere to go, uh, other than to, to, to pull closer to China. That has all sorts of implications in Japan, in East Asian politics, and everything that we've been trying to do in East Asia. You know, under this administration, we joined the East Asia Summit. We joined with Russia and India uh, as to, to make a sort of broader uh, forum in which we could all work out uh, these security issues. Uh, so th uh, that's the my second point geopolitically is as we are sort of thinking, okay, this means we need to draw closer to Europe and revitalize NATO. Again, we don't want to push that so far that we end up in a world that looks much more like the Cold War than any of us, any of us, whether it's Russia, China, or, or Western Europe, or Europe uh, and the United States want. And the final thing I'll say, now, now looking for you know where, how I would be advising both Turkey and Italy uh, and the EU more generally. Um, one way to think about Russia, the old Reagan trust but verify. I would call. I would think about trust but do a lot of contingency planning, or trust but prepare. And one of the things very clearly, if you are dependent on Russian energy, as many countries are, you should be thinking about, okay, fine, I'm not going, I don't want to disrupt this relationship right now, but I sure want to be developing alternative sources of energy. Uh, and that means, that means again that, um, you know, s Southern Stream versus Southern Corridor pipelines, we're, we're again sort of thinking about how to make sure there are pipelines that don't depend uh, or that can't be stopped by Russia. But it also should give new life to the possibility, and I've written about this, of a Mediterranean oil and gas community. Right? The European Union started with the European coal and steel community. And everybody says, oh yeah, but that was Europe. But that wasn't Europe. That was Europe in the 1950s. Right? Again, I'm half Belgian. We did not love the Germans. Right? The Belgians, the French, the, the enmity there in the 1940s, 1950s is just as powerful as anything that you're seeing now in the Middle East. You'd had three wars between 1870 and 1945 between the French and the Germans. And yet, there was the ability around energy to create a coal and steel community. You now have Turkey, uh, Turkey Greece, Cyprus, Lebanon, if it's stable enough, and Israel, with an extraordinary ability to invest in an oil and gas community. The amount of gas that's there, the possibility of revitalizing the Mediterranean as a whole, uh, as the center of Europe and Northern Africa, really Europe and Africa, is vast. Now that may seem like a pipe dream, but so too did the EU when Paul-Henri Spock and, and Jean Monnet started talking about it, and they started step by step. So there's an actual huge diplomatic opportunity here. And you note that Turkey and Israel have been creeping closer together, right? Uh, somebody was just telling me that there are 11 flights a day from Tel Aviv to Ankara. 11 flights a day, that's a lot. Right? And they're tremendous, there's lots of business connections there. There is a chance here again with Cyprus, there's, there, and there's clearly a tremendous need on the Greek side, and I would go all the way to Italy, for at least starting to do that diplomatic work and start to do it in the shadow of, you know, we want to diversify our options. We want to trust, but prepare. So with that sort of Israel, I mean, sorry, uh, Italy and Turkey, NATO, 
versus the possibility of uh, renewed uh, Russian-Chinese uh, ties in ways that I think uh, would not be beneficial. And then thinking about the Mediterranean, I think I'll leave it there. Thanks, Anne-Marie. That was great food for thought. I love that, that concept of the Mediterranean oil and gas community. I love this type of discussion because uh, uh, what I've been trying to do with the Europe program here at CSIS is park us right in the intersection of the politics and the economics. And as I've examined uh, the European economic crisis and all the dynamics, if you don't park yourself there, you really miss uh, that very rich uh, interaction. What I thought we'd do is I'll uh, pose a few questions to the panelists and then we will turn to you and uh, we look forward to bringing your thoughts and questions into the conversation. I would like to say, for the last 45 minutes, we have talked about the economic dynamic, and we have not mentioned once TTIP, the transatlantic <laughs> trade and invest. I, usually, we can't carry a conversation here in Washington on Europe if that, that word doesn't enter in uh, to our uh, conversation. So I, I'm going to just pose a few questions. I'll let you all three uh, take a take a swing at them. Uh, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, enormous amounts of enthusiasm on both sides of the Atlantic. We've just finished the fifth round, and we're starting to fall back into our routines, which uh, we dig in a little bit. Uh, Europe digs in a little bit. Um, and I think we're both feeling a bit frustrated. Um, this is big, big money is at stake. This is a very big deal geostrategically. But um, I fear, and I just would love your thoughts on how TTIP can change the dynamic. Now, obviously, Turkey now has a bilateral conversation with the US uh, on that. But how would TTIP, uh, if it's successful, and if it is not successful, how would that change um, the dynamic? And then um, my second question, and we've been, uh, lots of polling data has been coming out. Of course, today's Wall Street, so I feel like I'm a plug in the Wall Street Journal today. I guess so. Well, I'm not. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, uh, I guess NBC News, had a, a very striking poll about sort of American faith in institutions, which is dramatically low, <laughs> might get that big. Uh, I would say the same in Europe. And, and next month, we have the European Parliament elections, which I think we're going to have, I, you know, I hope my predictions are all wrong, extremely low turnout, and we're going to see a rise of anti-European parties that are saying, I don't want this, maybe ill-defining what, what they want. So at a moment when we need governments to reform in Italy, in Turkey, they are meeting public opinion that is very angry and does not trust them. So how does, how does this work? I, I'd love, uh, Giuseppe, your reflections on how the outcome of the European Parliament elections, I think some commentary, some analysts believe that uh, Prime Minister Renzi actually, in anticipation of some volatility on the European Parliament elections, actually had to push forward uh, in, in the shakeup in the party to actually try to get ahead of that volatile political moment. I'd welcome your thoughts, as well as, you know, Tim and Emery, the faith in, in institutions and in leadership. There were some very sobering poll numbers for President Obama in foreign policy that if you have some reflections, I, I would be grateful. And then my last question. Um, I just came back from Estonia several days ago. So Emery, I have, I have, I, uh, the Baltics are ringing in, in my ears right now and I can't tell you how sobering and serious the situation uh, is uh, as the Baltic states and Poland look after it. The one issue that came creeping back into the discussion time and time again, and I pose this to all three panelists because I think it is there uh, and we, we're not talking about it, is Russian influence in Europe. And by influence, I mean the commercial influence. Uh, one colleague gave me a statistic I had not realized that uh, Rosneft owns 20% of BP. BP is the largest payer uh, into the European, uh, UK uh, pension funds. If the, you know, that's a very powerful point. The Hungarian government just signed a $10 billion euro credit line for nuclear power plant in, in, uh, in Paksh. We see political party influence, NGO money. There's a lot of money. And I think what that money brings influence, and that is going to be a complicating factor when we talk about, um, you know, the, the punishment, if you will, about what has happened in Ukraine. And I just welcome reflections. Uh, I, I often get asked questions, do Americans watch Russia today? Do they watch RT television? That's a moment of propaganda. We've seen how powerful uh, President Putin's uh, propaganda is. 
So with those three very easy, very simple questions, so Giuseppe, let me turn over to you. You can, you can whack away at those. I'm helping you guys think your questions, so be ready when we come to you. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, let me also make a, a, a very brief comment on uh, what uh, has been said before in Italy, since uh, I think I, 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 I should be entitled to say something. Um, uh, <laughs> because it, it's, uh, it's, um, it, it must be clear that I think that Renzi understood one thing that was not clear to his predecessors, and that is that uh, the real match that we are going to, to play and hopefully win as a, as a country, but he has a leader, is not on the economic policy. It's politics. That doesn't move anything. In the, in the budget uh, law that is now under discussion, 10 billion euro don't change anything in the country. If you put on the enterprises or if you put on the people uh, low salaries, doesn't move anything. What means uh, is the structural and institutional reforms. That is exactly. the key point that you were rightly underlining. That means the competitiveness of the country. Because if he manages, and he did understand that, that to change something and gives the impression to the markets that we are able to uh, facilitate the decisional process in this country that has not moved in the latest 40 years, uh, then it would change something. Because the 300 trillion euro of liquidity that are going around the world that don't stop in Italy never, ever, maybe could stop. And this would change uh, something. Um, let me also say a word on the cost of capital, because this is important as well in, in, in the economic uh, uh, framework in Italy. I don't think that uh, to come out from the crisis, uh, we need uh, to focus on the cost of capital. I think that the real issue is a, an issue of uh, industrial policy. We have our the Italian enterprises average, they are exposed to banking debt for 80% of their funds. This is not sustainable any longer. In the United States, it's exactly the opposite. The average in Europe, continental Europe, is 70-30. So we need to rebalance this. We need to push. The, uh, the businessmen uh, to put more own funds into the capital of their enterprises. Otherwise, we will not survive a further crisis in the future. I'm saying this against the interest of the, of the short, uh, short term of the, of the banks, but it's, uh, it's absolutely in the interest of the, of the society. Uh, we cannot stand anymore with these small enterprises. It's too small. It's too small. We cannot go anywhere. We are not competitive at all on the global markets with the small enterprises that, by the way, are all de bank debted. How can you do that? The first credit crunch would destroy completely the industrial environment in Italy. So this has to be changed. And we are in close contact with the Ministry of Economy. They know perfectly uh, that this is a big weakness. The problem is that uh, whatever fiscal uh, push you, you decide, it's very difficult to push the, uh, the, the single owners uh, to change this uh, situation. So they are asking us to make a kind of educational continuous task towards the businessmen in order to to let them understand that for more capital we can guarantee, for more loans we can guarantee they have to put uh, 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 some uh, of their own funds in, uh, in their enterprise. And this is feasible in absolute term because you know that uh, the private richness in Italy is the highest in the world. Uh, so every single businessman has his own enterprise. It has his own real estate enterprise. Yes. That is, we have the productive 
richness that is the most taxed in Europe, but we have the unproductive richness that is the least taxed in Europe, at least until the EMU uh, uh, tax was introduced. So we have to, it's very simple, I mean, it, we have to switch some taxes from the productive to the unproductive and push the businessman to put the money to sell one, one uh, uh, real estate asset and to put that money in his company. Until we don't do this, we will never solve the problem. And if we speak, if we go on with the, with the, uh, uh, the discourse about uh, the cost of the capital uh, in terms of banking, we do not focus on the real problem in our country. Sorry, uh, but I had to say that. That's about, great. Uh, because because, because uh, uh, it's easy, but at the same time, it's complex. Uh, so, um, sorry, Ukrainian case, you, you also mentioned that, and, and I, am, I, I cannot miss to say a word on that, since, we, again, we have a bank in Ukraine, 6,000 people, uh, 400 branches, of which 20 are in Crimea. Well, I must say, where in Crimea, because we were forced to close, of course just because of lack of liquidity, because we were operating in Grivna, but we couldn't transfer liquidity from Kiev. The Russian authorities are asking us to operate in rubles, but I mean, uh, we are in a strange transition time, quite complex to manage. Uh, and we have a bank in Russia, uh, that is uh, the first foreign private bank uh, with 2% of the market, not much, but still, in a big country like Russia means something. Um, I think that whenever we speak about Ukrainian crisis, everyone is asking about Putin. That I'm not sure is the center of the problem. Especially if, when, if we speak about the, the causes of the crisis. Now maybe yes, because now, I mean, yeah, on the ground. Problems. But when we, if we go back to the causes, and this is important to go because otherwise uh, we miss the strategy uh, of how to uh, come out from this crisis. Then I see before Putin, I see some responsibilities that I put in first line. Maybe NATO's Rasmussen statements. Uh, secondly, strange uh, Lithuanian Polish leadership of the European Union. And uh, third, uh, Ukrainian ruling class. Mm. And then, finally, Putin, I would say. Uh, I would put in, in fourth position. Now, uh, to just to be short and, and, and constructive, uh, the sanction policy is, of course, key. But uh, is key if we have in mind that what is our strategy, because it cannot be the target of sanction policy. Sanction policy can be a tool, a mean to reach something. It's strange not to read so much about what is our final target. I personally think that uh, uh, part of our target is already in the Geneva Agreements, because the fifth point on the constitutional reforms is key mm -hmm. to calm down uh, the situation about uh, the uh, uh, more responsibility to local authorities. And then we should start speaking about the neutrality of this country. That is not a scandal. I mean, uh, we have used in the past uh, for uh, countries like Austria. Uh, maybe we should uh, recover some idea. I don't know. Uh, update it, maybe. Uh, I don't know what. But, but, but it's in, what has been missed until Geneva, it has been to sit down around the table. Uh, and discuss about the issues. Uh, I understand that uh, there is a, uh, sometimes also the idea that uh, you know, why uh, the young Ukrainians should condition their future to uh, the talks with Mr. Putin. But I also was surprised to see uh, Mrs. Sashton uh, or Mr. John Kerry offering coffee to Maidan uh, young people that were mixed with uh, other strange people that uh, were not exactly the, the future uh, hope uh, of, uh, of democracy in Maidan Square. So I think we, we really 
can find uh, a mediation solution uh, um, sitting at, around the table. The sanction policy, I agree with uh, Anne-Marie, is necessary and is, uh, 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 in, especially if it is well balanced, like it has been until now. Um, so I feel that, uh, just to make an example, if uh, the sanction policy has as a target a Russia bank, uh, that is a small bank uh, that uh, has among uh, its clients uh, all the oligarchs uh, that are supporting these riots, that is perfectly targeted. Very differently is, is if uh, it uh, goes towards uh, the major banks in, uh, in, uh, in Russia, like Sberbank, Nestor Bank, that are in involving uh, all the people, then here we risk to stimulate some nationalist reaction that I don't think is in the common interest. So, uh, uh, but I think, again, that uh, this has been uh, perfectly uh, organized until now. I also had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with Schuval of the Deputy Premier uh, in, in Berlin, and he himself, I mean, was very happy with the American <laughs> approach, uh, a little bit less for the European, because he said, I don't know whom to speak to. And, uh, and uh, it depends on what nationality he is, uh, that he changed completely <laughs> the, 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 um, the approach. So. Uh, I would leave uh, the TTIP to, to the American friends because I think that uh, it's, uh, the ball is in their field, uh, frankly <laughs> speaking. So I, I would prefer to listen instead of saying so. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. Tim, Emery? Uh, sure. I, uh, I completely agree. Italy, uh, like Europe writ large, needs to move from a mindset of wealth preservation to wealth creation. And that, that is a mindset. And you need a set of policies, tax policies, regulatory policies that, that represent that change in mindset. And you need industrial policy, as you noted, that, that uh, allows for economies of scale and doesn't penalize it, which is the current situation. And I agree that you need equity capital rather than uh, debt uh, investment. Uh, but you need capital markets to do that. And right now, capital markets don't exist. But we're all for it, and we'd love to see capital markets develop in Europe and generally, and in Italy specifically. Yeah. On TTIP, the challenge is. Uh, one is that the financial services is not a part of this conversation. So you've just written off an entire industry that would love to see uh, TTIP come uh, to fruition. The other is that no one believes that you're going to get trade promotion authority, which is certainly not before midterm elections. So why would you, whether it's the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership or it's the transatlantic negotiations, if you're uh, we're trading a, a, a partner or negotiating on the other side, why would you put your best deal on the table if you know the Americans are just going to pocket it wait and come back and try to start negotiating once again. I wouldn't. So I think that's, I don't think anything happens until we get past the midterm elections. Maybe if we get TPA uh, passed in a lame duck session, then 2015 can be a more, uh, uh, a more attractive environment to get these deals done. But I don't think anything done this year. On, uh, on the faith in institutions, that's, there's been a long-term trend uh, that uh, Americans have lost faith in organized religion. Anything big, big is bad. Uh, Wall Street is bad. Uh, uh, professional sports you know, mm -hmm. doesn't look so good today. Anything that's large is bad. And there is this desire for what is small and what is authentic. And if you're 20 years old and you're sitting in your parents' basement because you don't have a job and you can't afford rent, we have the highest percentage of young men living at home at any time since the 1950s, it's pretty hard to get excited about all those institutions which you think failed you over the previous 20 years. And it's a broader movement. So. Uh, how it manifests itself going forward remains to be seen, but it, it, we see it in politics, again, we see it in religion, we see it in sports, and we see it in the way in which young people think about uh, professional uh, careers. You know, the number one recruit out of Princeton is what? Teach for America, right? It's not, uh, it's not uh, Wall Street anymore. So I think there is a larger issue. And technology, I think, enables uh, social disintermediation and allows people uh, to bypass the big three networks. You can watch uh, whatever show you want to watch whenever you want to watch it. You don't need someone to decide that for you. So I think those are interesting trends. On Ukraine, I'll, I'll defer to the foreign policy experts here, but two things. One is there are no heroes here, you know. And the idea that, you know, that we want to, you know, glamorize the, it, 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 those who are now in power in Kiev versus the others, it, they're all various shades of gray. And the second point is, we in the West need to be very careful. It, it, we make decisions about how we think about other countries making decisions about themselves without thinking longer term. And we don't, we the West, and certainly Europe, doesn't want Ukraine, but it doesn't want Russia to have Ukraine. 
And so it's stuck in the middle. And that's, I suspect that's what the chancellor and the president will be talking about in the next 24 hours, uh, is we're not going to see Ukraine or Western Ukraine or whatever's left of it uh, as a part of the EU in our lifetime. And we're not going to see it a part of NATO in our lifetime. So what is it? And what are we prepared to do for it? And how long are we prepared, certainly the U.S., to sustain financial support? And I suspect not very long, because we in the U.S. grow very bored, and we're easily distracted by other events, and other events will come along. Okay. Hmm. Um, so let me start with Ukraine and, and, and then turn to TTIP and your, your other, other questions. I think there's no question that there are many sources of the Ukraine crisis, but I wouldn't say there are no heroes. I mean, really, what created this, again, more than Putin, more than Europe, was the desire of the Ukrainian people to have a government that works, right? And, and they tried it once. There was the Orange Revolution, and they put in place, they thought a new government that would work, and it was not much better than the old government, and then they returned to the old government. But the what you know i think what people overlooked here was everyone said well you know he he yanukovych canceled the uh, negotiations with europe and turned to russia and everybody went into the streets because they wanted europe everybody went into the streets because they thought europe was a better bet of a decent government than russia was which i think is true right to, i agree with you i don't think they're joining the east eu anytime soon but i do think the countries that have joined the eu have less corruption than the countries that haven't and what we're missing is actually tied to what you just said about faith in government. You've got a whole group of Ukrainian young people who want a different future and who are saying, no, you know, we want decent government that works. Like a lot of Americans are saying, we would like decent government that works. And we're not getting it at the federal level, you are getting it in some cities. So, and those, a lot of those folks are heroes. I mean, they're next to, next to some pretty ugly nationalists and they're next to some shady characters, I grant that. But there is a core of people who are willing to die, right? I, I don't know many Americans who are willing to stand up and take uh, against bullets. Uh, and they did, and they, they kept going. And our job in all this is to, div is to not let the geopolitics take over, right? That everybody thinks, oh, here we go, here's NATO, here's Russia, that, that we're back with this familiar script. But what's really going on is the demand of a population for a decent government. And part of what's got Putin so scared is that if they succeed, that is something Russians think they can do too. This is like Tunisia and, Europe, and Egypt, right? Where the, when the Tunisians did it and the Egyptians who sort of see Egypt, uh, Tunisia as not nearly as good a f football power and you know, a sort of smaller country without any of the great history and, and civilization that, that Egypt had, if Tunisia could do it, so could the Egyptians. Well, Putin is very, very worried uh, that if, if this succeeds in getting a decent government, then you know, he's got plenty of opposition just under the surface and he keeps squelching it down. So that's, um, that's where I would say that. And that's where, Giuseppe, I would, I'd push back. I mean, I, you know, Dennis McDonough says in the White House, nothing about you without you. I think we have gone past the age where the United States and Europe sits down with Russia and decides Ukraine's future. No, not today. That's not okay. We can, it was bad enough. It was going to be Russia and the U.S. At least we got Europe in there. But it's got to have Ukraine at the table. And if Ukraine wants to say we'll be neutral, great. You know, they could, I actually think if you put that to Ukraine as a whole, you're not getting, yes, we're dying to join NATO. They, and they, but, but neither can we say, as you know, Brzezinski's talking, throwing around terms like Finlandization, that's 20th century politics, that's gone. You, you can't do that today successfully, in my view. Um, on TTIP, so this goes back to my point about Russia and China, TTIP, and uh, TTP, two great trade initiatives, who's left out of both? Russia and China, right? And China thinks that uh, TTP, I support both, but they think it's a pretty clear effort to contain them uh, or to shut them out. Uh, we think, I think it's more likely that we want to set the standards with the current negotiating partners and then we probably will open it up to, up to China in the same way as with the WTO. But once again, if you're pushing, you know, we want a transatlantic trade partnership without Russia and we want a trans-Pacific trade partnership without China, think through the next steps. Um, 
last point, uh, point on, on trust in government, yeah, this is, this is everywhere. And this is, I, th I think, this is a much larger revolution. I, I often say that the divide between the digital natives and the non-natives, e.g. my generation and older, uh, is as great as the divide between the hippies in the 1960s and the 50s establishment. You just can't see it as visibly. They're not marching around in, in long hair and flower power and jeans, but they live in a different world. And they live in a world in which they're accustomed to being able to make things happen. Uh, as you point out, the, the, there's no the disintermediation. Another way to see that is if my son wants to learn something, he goes online and finds courses or information or other people who will do it, and he gets what he wants. And so they have no patience with institutions that can't deliver. Uh, and there, I think you're actually seeing that globally, and it, it's a source of a whole new other uh, conversation. Uh, so, and the last thing I'll just say, Heather, because you raised it and it's very important, go to the city of London and start talking about Russian influence, right? Russia owns enormous chunks of the city of London and enormous chunks of the French Riviera and enormous chunks of nice places to live and be all over Europe. And yeah, I mean, that, that is definitely a, a factor here. This is part of what I was saying that actually you can't go back to the Cold War. You actually want a Russia that is integrated with Europe in all sorts of ways, preferably less criminally than a lot of this money um, where, where it's coming from. But the U.S. cannot jerk us back to a world in which you know the Soviet Union was politically separate, but it was also economically separate. Now we've got something that's economically connected, more like China, and politically uh, separate. I have to say, and thank you all, it was a really great discussion. You really see corruption as this unifying thread, yes. starting with Gezi Park in some way, sort of the corruption of forcing something that obviously, uh, what those ties were, what is China undergoing right now is a profound attempt to re retain power and address corruption. Mr. Putin's, uh, how he has uh, organized his economy is so much based on corruption. Exactly. Uh, and of course, Ukraine is sort of the epicenter of that. And I think exactly the U Ukrainian people, it wasn't an East-West question, it was a question of corruption. Right. And that we do not focus on mm -hmm. enough. And quite frankly, the corruption in our own societies that that has come into. So. Thank you. Boy, I've got some good nuggets coming out of this conversation. I've got some writing to do. Now, let's welcome you into the conversation. Great. I see a hand. I see two hands. Oh, I see three hands. We're going to bundle four, four. hands. Okay. We're going to keep these questions short, my friends, but I want to bundle all of them together, and then I'll let you guys have the final say. So I saw, sir, I saw you over there. Please wait for a microphone. Identify yourself, your name, and your affiliation. Thank you. Yes, Clem Miller of Wilmington Trust Investment Advisors. Last year, well before you, the latest of developments in the Ukraine, the European Union Troika basically attacked Russian money in Cyprus. Uh, they, there was a huge write-off of deposits of Russian flight capital. I'm wondering if you think that that might be indicative of the degree to which the European Union might actually go in terms of attacking uh, Russian crony capitalist uh, money going forward, and I'll just put a parenthesis on that, uh, that um, uh, as I think uh, probably Tim knows, uh, you've got uh, a lot of, uh, and you probably know as well, you've got uh, com a lot of Russian companies, especially bigger Russian companies that have American depository receipts and global depository receipts uh, in, listed in, the, in New York, listed in London, listed in Luxembourg. Uh, custodied, not in Russia, but custodied in the West. And it seems to me that that could be uh, a way of uh, selectively targeting the crony capitalist companies. That one's for you because I didn't understand the question. <laughs> Tim will translate for the non-experts in the room. Oh, I was, okay, there was one question there, yes, and then the woman in the back after that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, I'm a visiting scholar at CSIS. I'm from Shanghai Institute for International Studies. Uh, my question is about the uh, relationship uh, between U.S. and China and Russia. Uh, I think uh, Mary has, has mentioned uh, uh, something uh, on this regard. My, my understanding is the U.S. is trying to uh, enforce, uh, enhance its security relationship with its allies, both in the Europe and Asia. 
to deal with the relationship with Russia and uh, China. And at the, at the economic front, uh, front, you mentioned the TPP and the TTIP uh, both ex exclude uh, Russia and China. Of course, China's uh, attitude towards the TPP is changing. Um, it's, it's getting more active. Um, my, my question is, uh, if, if the U.S. And want to uh, integrate the, the constructive role of Russia and China in dealing with global issues, uh, what kind of strategies we should rethink about uh, the new emerging powers? Thank you. Uh, my name is Lydia Velichkovska. I'm an independent consultant on EU policies. I have a question for Ms. Anne-Marie. Uh, regarding your statement, you said that there should not be uh, too much pressure over NATO. Uh, my question is, uh, what do you mean by that? Because there is an upcoming summit this autumn in Wales, and it should be like an enlargement summit. but. According to you, I would like to hear your opinion. Do you think it should be an enlargement summit or should be just like a, an ordinary summit as it was six years and back? Thank you. Thank you so much. And right there. And we'll have the final one right here. Thank you. I'm Helena Georgievich, Voice of America Serbian Service. Uh, we've uh, talked about Italy and um, Turkey specifically, but I wanted to ask you about Balkans. Uh, the position of the Balkans is a bit between rock and a hard place. The Balkans countries want to join European Union. Montenegro is fighting for NATO membership. On the other hand, mm -hmm. ties with Russia are extremely strong traditionally and today uh, commercially, economically. So what do you see that Balkans will have to choose sides eventually, or what would be the good strategy and balance for Balkan countries to deal in, in terms of Ukrainian crisis? Thank you. Okay, we'll take two more questions right up here and right back there. Thank you. Uh, I am Ricardo Alcaro from Brookings. Um, I have a question f also for Mrs. Lothar concerning the point she made about the fact that a sort of win-win or both-end both uh, <laughs> solution, arrangement, uh, is by far the most realistic prospect for uh, managing, if not solving, the Ukrainian crisis. I agree with that. However, how do you, um, I mean, I, I do see a sort of contradiction between this proposition and what you said about um, the fact that uh, discussing neutralization of Ukraine at the level of Europe, US, Russia is 20th century policy we, which we cannot um, uh, indulge in any longer. I must say it is perhaps 20th century uh, policy because in the 20th century for a large uh, part of it, the US and Europe were uh, keenly aware that there were limits to what they could do. Uh, what I see as a, as, a, as a newcomer here to Washington is that the Washington foreign policy establishment, including perhaps the State Department, but certainly the think tank community and the media, is stuck in a 1990 mentality in which basically uh, anything that the U.S. sets itself to doing can be achieved. And uh, so it's a sort of victory mentality uh, which uh, has a lot of issues with even imagining a situation with which the U.S. has to align with, has to accept, without actually being, without actually wanting it. Uh, but the reality is that Russia has much more interest in Ukraine than the West has, and this has been led bare by this crisis to all extents. So. The problem we had in Ukraine, one of the many problems, is that we did not have any uh, contingency planning, the, 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 the kind you, you actually uh, said we would basically uh, need many more, I mean, much more of. Uh, in, in 2008, uh, Georgia's president was basically pushed to uh, adopt very, very aggressive stances or very, well, aggressive perhaps is not the right word, but very daring, a very daring approach which, be, which eventually backfired because he thought the United States would be at his side and the United States wasn't when, when the time came 
for, for, for uh, uh, using arms or standing up uh, in defense of Georgia. Thanks, we had something you. very similar in Ukraine. Uh, so I, I, I'd say that given the limits, the United States and Europe recognize themselves yep. Uh, in terms of what they can do and, they want, and, they want, and what they want to achieve to do in Ukraine. Uh, talking about neutralization of Ukraine is just a sensible proposition. Thank Oops, thank you, Ricardo. And um, our colleague, one last question. Oh, what, you've got yes. microphones oh, coming at you yes. both too ways. Quick. <laughs> Hi, Luca Franchetti from the Italian Embassy. Uh, uh, very shortly, uh, uh, while I agree with Anne-Marie on, on her reading on how to, to deal with, uh, with, with Russia, I mean, Russia matters, but this brings me to a second, what is my question that to tip. It's true that uh, Russia matters, but uh, Russia should not be uh, the incumbent on our, on our decisions. And I think that while you say that one of the weaknesses of the TIP is that Russia is not involved, there I slightly disagree, in the sense that uh, uh, maybe Tim can correct me if I'm not wrong. Uh, roughly two thirds of the of the world trade is uh, between the U.S. and Europe as a bloc. So uh, the fact that uh, these two blocks uh, decide to uh, to go for uh, for an agreement that is uh, in projection demonstrates that it will trigger uh, our, our internal uh, GDP and our trade is not per se uh, anti-Russian and it, 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 be, it we may be wrong not to do it because Russia is outside and, and Russia is outside pour cause because we are a homogeneous economies and this is why uh, the TTIP in my view has more chances to, to succeed than the TPP uh, where you, you, are, you are talking with uh, disomogeneous blocks. So I think that it is more than normal that the uh, US and the EU uh, look for a transatlantic uh, uh, partnership that would benefit both economies and at the end of the story maybe also set standards and maybe this is what worries countries like uh, Russia or China who uh, despite one of them being in the WTO maybe the standards are not really uh, fully uh, fully met so uh, I don't see the absence of Russia in the TTIP as a weaknesses on the contrary we think it's a natural interest that both um, shores of the Atlantic have and, and it can even have a, a, a positive influence in the Doha nego negotiation in the future of the, the WTO. Thank you. You had some really good questions thrown at you and your challenges, you have two minutes each to respond to them. Uh, so Joseph, I'm going to start with you and we'll pass it quickly down. I think, uh, I think most, of, most of the questions were for Anne-Marie and, and so <laughs> That's an easy I, way I, to I will focus uh, on, <laughs> on one question that you did and it was without answer at the end of the day that is about European elections. Yes. Uh, I think it, it is important to um, uh, evaluate properly uh, a, a new fact that uh, has not been uh, yet uh, underlined. That is, for the first time in history, we have uh, candidates of the two major political blocs uh, that are going to be uh, chosen as president of the commission. This means for the first time we will have uh, a form of election, even if not direct, of the President of Europe. And this will have, I think, an incredible uh, positive effect on, an, on the upgrade of the European institutions that we would need, and there is an in, an, a, a never-ending debate on what would be the right way to uh, modify the treaties in order to, and this is, is possible to have because with the, present crisis uh, and the, 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 the idea of passing through approval of the uh, 28 parliament is impossible. But this is cleaning all the picture with a political decision that is forcing the institutions to have uh, a strong, finally, person leading the euro. I think that this would affect also the relationship of strength between the um, temporary presidency and uh, the, the president of the council. So the three uh, people that today are the leaders of Europe risks to uh, gather into only one, uh, only because of this pressure. And by the way, this is not uh, uh, shared by all the opinionists because there is some cynical, uh, typical uh, approach that is going to say that then at the end they will uh, negotiate uh, uh, a lower position for one of them as a commissioner, and this will uh, be left aside uh, because Mrs. Merkel doesn't agree, etc. But on the contrary, I do not think that this will be feasible. Once 
we will have election and the strong support to one of these parties, uh, I, I think that this is the real new fact, more than uh, the populist and nationalist uh, uh, parties that, by the way, they are not uh, uh, united. So I don't think that uh, despite the importance of the political meaning of their um, uh, growth, uh, they will not be uh, translated into a real political power inside the, the European Parliament. Thank you. That was a great, great reflection. Tim? Uh, sure. Two minutes. Uh, uh, Russian sanctions are coming. I suspect we'll see it uh, on an increasing number of financial institutions, maybe uh, writ large. Uh, and then from there, they go after critical industries. Uh, there'll be a question of whether they go after oil and gas. But certainly, you can go after uh, aircraft spare parts, for example, which would be a real, you know, Boeing and Airbus would be a real way to cripple uh, the Russians. But I suspect banks are the next. And, uh, and then the issue will be how wide uh, acceptance the sanctions will be. I, I expect the UK will, will uh, join in, which will certainly hurt the Russians. What happens on continental Europe remains to be seen. Uh, on global trade, yeah, it, doesn't bother, it doesn't bother me the Russians aren't there. You know, we have to think about this as a multiple tier chess game. You have uh, global trade negotiations, which unfortunately Doha Round is dead and is going to be dead, is dead and will remain dead. So what you go with is uh, uh, second best uh, solutions, which are regional, and you piece them together the best you can. And, and on top of that, you also do bilateral. So uh, you know, I hope I'm wrong. I hope that uh, the congressional sentiment changes and we'll be able to get TPA done quickly, and then we can go to TPP and TTIP. But I don't think I'm wrong. And on, on Ukraine, I, I didn't mean to say the, the Ukraine people uh, weren't heroes. I'm just saying the people who are actually occupying seats, uh, the uh, levers of power are not heroes. And you know, what, what really pains me is that uh, we in the West could, could repeat this cycle where we encourage them to take up mm -hmm. arms and, and to liberate themselves, and we send a few billion dollars, and we send over a couple of co congressional codels, and we have some panels, and then we go, we go home, and we go off to the next crisis, the next issue. It will take a generation, under the best set, set of circumstances, it will take a generation to transform that economy into a true Western style, uh, functioning, non failed state. And the question is are we in the West, are we willing to stay there and do what it takes to help them be what they want to be? I'm skeptical. Great. Thank you. Okay. So let me be clear. I, I support both TTIP uh, and TTP. Uh, um, TPP and in their current form. But I would say from 1990 to the present, the politics of inclusion have worked better than the politics of division. The EU has been the single greatest force for peace in the world. They, if without the EU and joining the EU, you would have Ukraine all over Eastern and Central Europe. You'd have had Hungary, you'd have had Bulgaria, you'd have had the Czech Republic, you'd have had Slovakia, you'd have had the Balkans. Without the ability to join the EU and NATO, those countries would have been destabilized and we would be in a far worse position. I'd say more broadly, without the WTO and the ability of China to join the WTO and what Russia to join the WTO, WTO, you didn't have all the incentives you want to start getting to those modern economies. So, but the problem was we were only willing to include un, up to a certain point but in East-West relations, right? And so I was part of the, the debate about the expansion of NATO, and I supported the expansion of NATO, but I remember hearing Brzezinski say, yeah, we should expand NATO and get as, as close to the Russian border as we can, and when Russia flips, then we'll be, we'll be in a much better position. Well, not surprisingly, the Russians don't particularly love that view. You know, I always point out, if the Warsaw Pact had expanded to Mexico, we'd have gone bananas. So it, it, you have to, what I'm trying to suggest is we need to, to find ways, and this goes to your enlargement summit question. I think the future of NATO probably has to be a defense community and some kind of political community and maybe some kind of, you know, a, a broader community that's committed to good governance. Th there've got to be some parts that Russia can join. You Otherwise, you just can't, you, you, you've got a classic security dilemma. Of course, Russia's going to push back with the idea that it's going to recreate parts of the Soviet Union. Sh so should we. So what I'm suggesting, I don't think we are going to enlarge to take Georgia or Ukraine. I don't think there's an appetite in in NATO. I don't think there was an appetite in NATO five years ago, and there's certainly not now. 
but you, then you have to create other things that both the West and the, the Russia can be part of that, that give the countries, be they in the Balkans, be they uh, in, in the near, Russia's near abroad, multiple identities at once, right? The Ukraine, that was my point about both end. Ukraine can be part of the West and part of the East, and more, most importantly, it's got to, to forge its own, its own path. Just um, one more point. Uh, so, so that's, uh, you know, do, and do I have the perfect solution? No, but I can, I, I'm pushing us to go in that direction rather than, than returning to a world in which I, I don't think we can get there economically. We are now interdependent, and politically we're in a very different place. Last thing I'll just say on your point, it's interesting to hear you say that we're back in the 1990s and the, and the U.S. thinks we can do anything when most Americans are attacking the president for basically saying, you know, no, we can't do what we used to do. I mean, he just gave this powerful argument about how, no, we're no longer in a situation where we can dictate results and I'm doing the best I can one crisis at a time. Um, it, yeah, he's being so. So my final point would be: I actually think uh, the United States cannot dictate. It never could dictate as well as we think it could. I mean, I you know I remember 1982 when our popularity in Germany was four percent because we were trying to put in intermediate nuclear missiles. The idea that we could dictate to Europe was is a figment of our imaginations. Um, I think to me the issue is really figuring out how to lead in a different way. And I will end with the point that I think we can simultaneously engage the Ukrainian people or the Russian people or the Chinese people in one way. And you know, yes, we're out there with them, we're communicating with them, we're working with them in all sorts of ways, and engage their governments often in a different way. And I see the foreign policy of this future is that the nation that figures out how to do that best, so you are simultaneously doing your diplomacy with respect to people, groups of people, and with governments, are the, are the countries that are gonna be best positioned for this constant disruptive flow of popular politics and traditional geopolitics. Those are some big ideas, and we need to think New America is about big ideas. There, absolutely. <laughs> so CSIS, absolutely. And, uh, uh, thank you all so much. This was a really terrific discussion. I think we need to do more of it. Thank you, all three of you, for, for wonderful insights. Uh, audience, again, thank you for trekking through bad weather. Please join me. Thank you.